Well, thank you, Debo, for um, introducing me. And um, before I introduce um, Trevor, I think it's important that we do um, show our gratitude for Debo for the work that she's done in bringing us all together. Um, she's just a fantastic achievement for what she's been doing. Um, it gives me great um, pleasure, and it's an absolute privilege to introduce to you Trevor James. Trevor James made, his, made UK history in December 2008 by becoming the first black managing partner at the London office of Morrison & Forrester, a leading US international firm. Trevor has over 20 years experience in providing corporate and international tax advice on a wide range of issues. He has advised international banks, public and private companies, venture capital houses, hedge funds, as well as high net worth individuals in relation to the acquisition and disposals of companies and business assets. Trevor has a particular expertise in advising on the tax aspects of private equity and merger and acquisitions and employee um, equity particip participation strategies. Prior to joining uh, Morrison, For Morrison and Forrester in 2005, Trevor was the joint head of international tax at Bird and Bird, and before that, he was the head of the London Group of Tax at the international firm DLA Piper. Um, and Trevor is also a graduate of the University of Essex and qualified in 1989. Um, that's the academic and professional background, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about the man himself. Um, Trevor is a, a contemporary of mine. We both qualified in 1989, and I've been able, I've had the pleasure to sort of track his career um, um, as I've, you know, sort of make, tried to make my way in the legal profession. And he, even if he doesn't know it, has been one of my role models in terms of my career. That's how much I highly, um, highly regard Trevor. And to give you an example of how much of a trailblazer Trevor is, I remember um, six years ago that I was fortunate enough to go to the Cannes Film Festival. I think, I think people need to know this. And so there I am. It's been an ambition of a lifetime for me in terms of doing commercial work that I could get a really sexy deal down at the Cannes Film Festival. So I was there, I landed, and I was on the um, Le Croisette, which is the um, posh word for being on the French promenade, pacing up and down amongst all the film stars, etc. And then I saw in the distance a huge crowd of people, an absolute buzz going around. So I thought, who's there? Is it Denzel Washington? Is it Michael Jackson? And so when I got there, holding court amongst about 50 people was Trevor here, <laughs> talking about the really interesting dimensions of international tax and how people could save money. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome Trevor James. I don't know whether to thank you or just to hit you. Um, but thank you, Michael. I've known Michael a long time. As you said, we, we go back um, back to the 80s when we um, worked in the city. So, OK. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, as my kids will say, it's really cool to share a platform with Baroness Scotland and District Judge Singh. I think that's amazing and you know I'm going to call my mum tomorrow give her something to testify in church on Sunday <laughs> so here we go um, I've been asked to talk let, let me get this right talk about my journey to the present day as managing partner but before I do that let me just just say let me let me just say something there's two things that I try to avoid um, in life generally one, talking about myself, because I just don't like doing it. And two, having pictures taken of me. <laughs> you know, I mean, my mother and my wife are my biggest cheerleaders. They talk about me, and I generally try to disappear down the chair when they do. And as regards pictures, you know, I went as far as thinking of taking a photography course. So I'm behind the camera rather than in front, but that's probably taken a bit too far. This lady's got me to do both on the same day. She's very persuasive. Um, so I know we all want to listen to Baroness Scotland, and I know that you know 
I'm standing in between, so I'm going to be as quick as possible, get this out of the way, and we can listen to the main event. <laughs> so, about me. Okay, my... I think my background is probably typical of, of most people. Um, to use a dusty, dusty Springfield um, phrase, I'm the son, son of a preacher man. I was born in northwest London of West Indian parents. I, you know, schooled in northwest London, absolutely loved my sport. We had a conversation earlier on about cricket and football, etc. I loved my sport at school. I was quite fortunate to play or to, to, do, to do athletics at a reasonably high level. But from a very, very early age, I understood the importance of education something drummed into me by my parents, and something that luckily I got. Because I was determined that I was not going to end up in a dead-end job, taking orders from someone that I probably wasn't going to respect. Quite frankly, they would have sacked me. I mean, I, just as an aside, during my A-levels, had a job in Sainsbury's. It, I lasted six weeks because I tried to tell the manager why he was, you know, what he was doing wrong in his job. <laughs> because he got me to stack baked beans, and I was telling them, that's not what I do. So he sacked me. <laughs> okay, so, you know, I knew that I had to find a way out. So, worked hard, got my O-levels, that's old school, that's old money for GCSEs for the young ones. <laughs> um, got my A-levels, then I went off to university in 1983. Yes, I know you weren't born then, and you're thinking to <laughs> yourself, this guy's old, whatever, okay? <laughs> Let's just deal with it. So I went off to university to read law, absolutely loved it. 1985, I decided that I, you know, had to go and apply for articles. That's old money for training contract. You know, we, we should have a sort of glossary of sort of <laughs> old and new terms because I feel really old now. So 1985, I decided that I wanted to do my training at a corporate firm and you know in those days there was absolutely nothing available in terms of of career advice all i had was an out-of-date copy of the law society solicitor's directory i went to the careers department and the, the advice they gave me was absolute rubbish because no one really took me seriously so I thought, okay, let's take stock. What do we know? I knew that to do corporate work in a wider sense, to do it properly, or not properly, no, that's unfair, but the place that one should try to do it was the city. So I knew that, tick. And, you know, and actually there was not much else. And remember in those days, there was no internet. Yes, this was, this, this was the olden days, guys, okay? There was no laws, no legal 500, no chambers directory. So basically, I thought, I've got to find this out for myself and find it out pretty quickly. So drafted a CV, got someone to type it up for me, and then sat and wrote letters of applications to firms. And my general rule of thumb was it had to be an address that started with EC, Basic, okay, very, very basic. And, you know, the more partners in a firm, the better. <laughs> and that's generally what I did. And, you know, and, and I did things like my sister worked, worked in town, so I said to her, go to this firm and get a copy of their brochure, because I had to do some research. So it was really what we call boxing and coxing it and trying to find a way through. So, second year university, I was on for at least a 2-1. My tutors thought with a bit of wind behind me, I could probably get a first, you know. So I thought, yeah, this is good, you know. I'm going to get interviews. So it was fantastic when letters started to drop on the doormat. Well, like, I was in digs, so it wasn't was really a doormat. We couldn't afford a doormat in those days. Letters just dropped. <laughs> and um, invited me for interviews. So mum, bless her, gave me some money to buy a suit and to buy some ties. And off I went to the bright lights of the city to go for interviews. Fantastic, you know, with, with sort of tube pass, et cetera. So I thought these interviews were going well. But, you know, 
letter started to drop on the sort of doormat again and saying, thanks for coming, but no thank you. And I thought, that's fine, you know, just send some more applications, research harder, work harder. The problem is you, you've got to work harder because this is what you want to do. The, the time that I thought there was something slightly wrong was I went for this interview at this very large city firm that I'm not going to mention, and this partner said to me, hmm, I've never interviewed a coloured person before. And then I felt a bit like a social experiment, you know. <laughs> so how are you finding this? You know, what's it like, etc. And I thought, you know, um, very, very odd. But I thought, let's just, you know, bypass that and let's just carry on with, 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 with the project, with the cause. More interviews, more letters of rejection. But I kept telling myself, the problem is with you. You've got to try harder. You've got to research more and, you know, just keep applying. So eventually, I got an offer from a 15-partner firm on Fleet Street called Roslyn King. Bless them. Love them to bits. Roslyn King, remember the name. Um, good firm. Lovely firm. So then it was, OK, project number two, Learn as much as you can from the partners and associates that you're going to come in contact with. And that's exactly what I did. I made sure that I got as much out of them as possible. Because my view of, of, of a training contract is you start off with an empty bag and you, you need to fill the bag with as many tools as possible because that's what you're going to need throughout your career. So on qualification, I decided I want to be a tax lawyer. I think that's probably down to the fact, I've got a bit of a scar here, which was when, when I was age four, probably never recovered. So, you know, <laughs> I decided I wanted to become a tax lawyer, quite edgy. So I left Rosalind King and went to Theodore Goddard. Now I was talking to Christina, where's Christina? She knows what I'm talking about, because she was at, she, she, she's a Theodore Goddard alumni as well. Sure got yeah, it was still got it in those days. <laughs> so TG, as we affectionately know, uh, knew it, they regarded themselves as a mini slaughter in May, which meant they were big on quality, big on training, big on client service. And I still say that was the best move of my career. I worked with this chap called Simon Stubbins, and I'm going to mention him. I'll say the name again, Simon Stubbins, and, I'll, and you'll understand why in a minute. So I joined this, this, this firm in October 1989 after taking a month off and sort of being a youngster in Spain, um, you know, sort of doing my live a lot of damage. I, I, I was a young kid, okay? I was, I was 24 years old. So. I joined this firm and it was, it, it was actually quite bizarre because I started to get fantastic work, started to be put on really complex projects, sometimes in preference to associates that were more qualified than me, a lot older than me. And I actually didn't quite get it. And at one point in time, one of the associates decided to leave to go to McKenna and Co, as it was called then. And I persuaded my boss, I said, look, don't replace her. Give me the work that you would otherwise have given her. And he thought, fine, whatever, the guy's mad. And he agreed to, um, to undo that. What I didn't know, and this is the point, what I didn't know, he had an agenda of his own. And, and the agenda arose because of this. When I joined Theodore Goddard, I was the first and only black assistant, as we were called then. And... This is what I got to learn years later. Within my first week, he got calls from a number of his partners, basically saying, what exactly do you think you're doing employing this black person? My boss, bless him, told all these partners to go forth and multiply. <laughs> and his mission was to basically make them eat their words. So that's why I got put on these fantastic projects, because typically, 
the partners that led those projects were those people that called him. So, you know, an amazing um, experience having this great work. Most times I didn't actually know what I was doing. You know, I sort of made up as I went along. Um, limitation period has passed, so they can't sue me, so that's fine. But, you know, I just learned a great deal 